this one is a <clears throat> listener requested topic on seeing and diagnosing hypertrophy on the EKG. This one comes from Lake, so this is for you, bud. Anyway, to get started, this is my new member of my family, everybody. Ivy Bella Johnson. She comes Friday. We're so stoked about it. She, she cute? Anyway, so when we're talking about hypertrophy on the EKG, we got to keep in mind we got four kinds, right? We have four different chambers, so each chamber can develop hypertrophy. So we can have right atrial hypertrophy, left atrial hypertrophy, right ventricular hypertrophy, and left ventricular hypertrophy. And you'll also see this written in books as like atrial enlargement or left atrial enlargement. Um, so <clears throat> as far as the ventricles are concerned, though, you're always going to see it written as hypertrophy. All right. So we're going to start off with right atrial hypertrophy or right atrial enlargement. Think about causes, all right? Now, causes with right atrial hypertrophy, you got to think of, you know, any condition that would actually increase the muscle size. And if you remember the definition from paramedic school of actual hypertrophy, you're thinking about the actual increase in the size of the cells itself, the actual increase in size of the muscle. We're not talking about hyperplasia when you're talking about the increase in number of cells. You're talking about the actual increase in size. So you're thinking COPD or lung disease, tricuspid stenosis, if you have that, that, uh, that valve that's separating your right atrium and, and uh, right ventricle, that's becoming stenotic or narrowed, <clears throat> the, right, the right atrium has to pump at a higher pressure, so therefore it's going to make that muscle hypertrophic. And then, of course, your congenital heart diseases like pulmonary stenosis. Again, you have the pulmonary valve that sits on the right side of the heart. And your tetralogy of phthalate or fillet, however you want to say it, <clears throat> which is your uh, uh, congenital heart defect that consists of four different things. We're not going to get into that in this lecture. All right. So we're also thinking about primary pulmonary hypertension. <sighs> but as far as all your testing is concerned, we're really thinking about COPD causes of your right atrial hypertrophy. All right. So how do we diagnose it? Well, diagnosing is pretty easy and pretty straightforward. You're looking at your inferior leads, 2, 3, and AVF, and you're counting the height of the P wave. If it's greater than 2.5 millimeters, you have diagnostic right atrial hypertrophy. Or you're looking in your V1 and V2 leads, your right <clears throat> percordial leads, at a P wave that's 1.5 millimeters. Just like in ventricular hypertrophy, when you're looking at QRS complexes, for atrial hypertrophy, you're looking at your P waves, all right? So for right atrial hypertrophy, you got to think your three P's, all right, and that's your pointed, prominent, and pulmonary. We're looking at it. Are they look pointy? Are they very prominent, meaning that they're big? And if they are big, we're thinking pulmonary in nature, like a COPD type uh, patient. So this is what your P wave is going to look like. If you count your little boxes here, you know you start at the beginning of your P waves. You got one, two, almost three. That's greater than two and a half. So that would be diagnostic. Right atrial hypertrophy, if this was an inferior lead, or if this was a V1 lead or a V2 lead, you're looking at one and a half, all right? So looking at this EKG, and I got a lot of these EKGs from Life in the Fast Lane, which is an awesome site. If you haven't checked it out yet, you should go. But, you know, the first thing that, that you should kind of, well, not the first thing, but when you're looking at this EKG, you see that this is an upward pointing V1. And the only times that should really happen is for a right bundle branch block and, and uh, for... Um, right ventricular hypertrophy, which we haven't really got into yet, but we're thinking right bundle. So if we see it, we got a right bundle, um, possible RSR prime complex. We have a rightward axis, even though this isn't, you know, complete right axis deviation, you have a rightward axis, large P's, and low QRS volumes. This trilogy here is a classic COPD patient for low QRS, rightward axis, pointed P waves, um, you're really thinking this is a, a COPD patient. And you look at those P waves right there in V2, really see them in V3, especially the P to QRS volume is way out of whack, even in uh, AVF. You have a P wave that's almost the same size, as your, or even the same size as your QRS complex, which is very big. The three, P, the three Ps are, uh, are there, pointed, prominent, pulmonary. This is right atrial hypertrophy. All right. That simple for right atrial hypertrophy. Moving on to the left atrial hypertrophy. Well, again, we got to know causes. So just like right atrial hypertrophy was classically seen with uh, tricuspid stenosis, your left atrial hypertrophy is classically seen with mitral stenosis. And for your FPC exams, know that. <clears throat> this is probably going to be associated with a, um, you know, either a heart murmur or a click. All right. 
Uh, you'll also see it with systemic hypertension. Now, just like right atrial hypertrophy, you'd see it with pulmonary hypertension. With left atrial hypertrophy, you'd classically see it with systemic hypertension or an aortic stenosis condition. Um, and also on your FPC exam, you're always worrying about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which is the number one cause of death in young athletes that drop dead of sudden cardiac arrest. All right. So we're looking at EKG findings. Well, the best definition that I've read uh, that kind of makes sense to me when diagnosing left atrial hypertrophy is this. When you're looking at your P waves in lead two, you're looking for that bifid P wave with greater than 40 milliseconds between the two peaks. All right. Now, this is going to be a peaked P wave that is notched. It almost looks like a McDonald's M, all right? And that is called P mitrali. So with your pointed peaked pulmonary P waves in right atrial hypertrophy, we call that P pulmonali that are peaked with the, with the, uh, the pointed uh, notched type P waves that look like the McDonald's M. We call that P mitrali, all right? One P is pulmonary nature, being right atrial hypertrophy. The other P is uh, left side of the heart in nature, mitral valve in nature, P mitrali. All right, and I'll show you a picture of that. So total P wave duration also greater than 110 milliseconds. You're also going to see a biphasic P1. I'm sorry, a, bi a biphasic P and V1 uh, with the same criteria, but we're looking at different numbers. Terminal negative portion greater than 40 milliseconds. We'll go over what actually that means. All right, so. Huh? Yeah. This is what I'm talking about. These are what your P waves are going to look like in left atrial hypertrophy. Not so much pointy and tall like right atrial hypertrophy P waves. With left atrial hypertrophy P waves, they're going to be longer and notched. And this is the notch you're talking about. This is P mitrali right here. All right. So a bifid P greater than 40 milliseconds between the two peaks. What we're doing is we're finding the two peaks and we're counting. This is one small box, 0.4 seconds. That's 40 milliseconds. It's greater than that, so therefore this is left, left atrial hypertrophy. It's that simple. Or we're counting the entire P wave distance. If it's greater than 110, then you have left atrial hypertrophy. So that's 4, 8, 12. That's greater than 120 milliseconds, so it has two diagnostic numbers for being left atrial hypertrophy when you're looking at your P wave. All right. So that whole term negative portion of the P wave, well, when you look at it, this is not necessarily a P mitrali. It's not P mitrali because it's not notched. It doesn't look like the McDonald's M. This is a biphasic P wave. All right. It goes up and then it goes down. Biphasic P waves are classically seen in left atrial hypertrophy as well. But what we're doing with these, we can't count the distance between the notches like we could in a P mitrali P. We can only count the downward portion of it. So I start at where I would imagine this isoelectric line would be, and I count over. All right? That is your negative portion of the P wave. If it's greater than 40 milliseconds in duration, that terminal end, all right, that negative terminal end, because it's going down, negative terminal end, is greater than 40 milliseconds you have uh, left atrial hypertrophy. All right, moving on to right ventricular hypertrophy, right? So causes, most of the same causes as you would see in a right atrial hypertrophy type patient, right? Pulmonary hypertension, the same cause of left atrial hypertrophy, be mitral stenosis, you can have a PE. These are classic uh, COPD type patients and congenital heart defects as well can all cause right ventricular hypertrophy. Now, when we think of the EKG findings, we, we kind of imagine that the patient's right ventricle is enlarged. And because it's enlarged, it has decrease in inotropy. And because it has decrease in inotropy, it, the, the, the heart's going to try to pull all the available electricity towards it and depolarize it at a lot greater voltage. So therefore, that's what we're looking at. We're looking at voltage. And because the right ventricle... Um, is so enlarged, then it does pull all the electricity towards it, you're probably going to see a right axis type deviation, all right, or a right word axis deviation. It doesn't have to happen all the time. But if you see right axis deviation, that should be one of the things in your differential about what's actually causing it, right? So when we're looking at the EKG, 
the main things that we're looking at is the R wave in V1. It's got to be pointing up, right? Normally, the R wave in V1 is pointing down, but if we have an upward deflecting R wave in V1 that's greater than 7 millimeters tall or has an RX complex of greater than 1, the R wave is really big in relationship to the S wave, then we have to start thinking it's a right ventricular hypertrophy condition. We also look at the S wave in V5 or 6, your low lateral leads. All right? If it's 7 millimeters deep, then we have criteria for right ventricular hypertrophy. All right? Now keep in mind that if your QRS duration is, is less than 120 milliseconds, then the changes that you see is probably not due to a right bundle because one of the diagnostic criteria of a right bundle branch block is an upward deflecting uh, R wave in V1. So if it's less than 120 milliseconds, it's probably not due to that right bundle. You have to have a wider complex for that complete right bundle branch block to be, abs to be actually um, flipping your R wave up in V1. So let's look at it. <clears throat> well, we're looking at this, right? I see down, up, up. So right here, I have a right axis deviation, right? So I move on. Now I'm looking at my precordial leads. I have a complete loss, <clears throat> a complete loss of R wave progression, right? And whenever I have a complete loss in R wave progression, one of the first things I'm thinking of is an anterior wall am I. I don't see any reciprocal changes. I don't see any infarction patterns here, but I do see ST segment depression. That's kind of slooping downward, all right? Now let's see what that means. I have an upward deflecting V1. All right. So when I see that, I'm thinking either A, right ventricular hypertrophy, or B, right bundle. Now, I don't have a QRS duration that's greater than 120 milliseconds, and I don't have an RSR prime pattern. I also don't have a slurring S wave here in one like you kind of always see in a right bundle. So I'm counting my R wave. All right. My R wave pointing upward is greater. It's like 12 or 13 millimeters. Now I'm looking at my S wave here in V5 or 6. That's greater than 7 millimeters as well. So that is diagnostic for right ventricular hypertrophy. This ST segment depression that I'm seeing here is not due to ischemia. This is called a strain pattern. You usually see it in V1 through 4. Now some books might say V2 through 4. But you're looking at this ST segment depression that's in relation to your R wave and S wave changes. All right. If you have criteria for ventricular hypertrophy with ST segment depression, this is just RVH with a strain pattern, all right? And that's what that would be called there. So not that bad, huh? Let's look at another one. So I have down, up, up. This is criteria for right axis deviation. We're not going to be calculating right axis. Um, if you need help calculating axis deviation, you can check out my other axis deviation podcast. But down, up, up. <clears throat> now I'm looking at my V1. Now, V1's pointing up, so I'm thinking either right bundle or I'm thinking right ventricular hypertrophy. Now, you can't really see the boxes here. That's a really tall R wave, greater than 7 millimeters. I have tall S waves here, especially in V5, greater than 7 millimeters. I have, I have T wave inversion. This is a strain pattern. This is right ventricular hypertrophy with strain. If I look here at lead 2, I have a very big P wave pointing upward. That's greater than two and a half millimeters. So this is also right atrial hypertrophy. So this guy's right heart is just hypertrophic. So he's got right atrial hypertrophy and right ventricular hypertrophy on this EKG. All right, pretty cool. Moving on to ventricular hypertrophy. Now, if you do any reading on ventricular hypertrophy, the same causes for right ventricular hypertrophy would be your left ventricular hypertrophy, meaning anything that causes an overload type problem like aortic stenosis or uncontrolled hypertension, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, anything that causes that right ventricle to be overloaded will give you ventricular hypertrophy. Now there are a lot of different criteria for diagnosing ventricular hypertrophy, but the most commonly used and the easiest is the sokolov lion criteria, which says that if you take an S wave, in V1, the depth plus the tallest R wave in V5 or 6, if it equals 35 millimeters or greater in a patient that's older than 35 years of age, you have diagnostic criteria for left ventricular hypertrophy. All right. I've also heard it that if you take the S wave in V1 or 2, add it to the uh, R wave in V5 or 6, if it's equal to 35 millimeters 
um, you have left ventricular hypertrophy. All right, so let's check it out. Now, looking at this EKG, I have up, up, down. All right, now this is bordering on um, some axis deviation, although this is probably a physiologic left axis. All right, we're not going to calculate it real quick though, but think about it too. If I have left ventricular hypertrophy, the left ventricle is bigger, it's hypertrophic, the muscle size is bigger, so it's going to pull all the available electricity towards that ventricle. But because the left ventricle sits in the normal axis of the heart, you might not see axis deviation. And you're probably not going to see uh, like a, a weird R wave progression like you would in a right ventricular hypertrophy. So looking at this, all right. The first thing I notice is that I have very, very <clears throat> deep S waves in my precordial leads. So that's going down. V2 is really down. V5 and 6 is pointing very up. So when I'm looking at it, I'm counting my R wave, my, I'm counting my boxes for my S wave down here, right? And if you do the counting, it's, uh, you got five, you got to see here, okay, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25. So just V1 alone is 25. So then I count my R waves pointing up. So I have 30, 35, 40. So right there, all automatically, if I add up my S wave in V1 to my R waves in V6, that equals 35 millimeters. That's diagnostic left ventricular hypertrophy. Now also, you'll notice that you have some ST segment depression in V5 or 6. Now just like if you saw ST segment depression in your Procordial leads V1 through 4 uh, for right ventricular hypertrophy, that would be called strain. In your left ventricle, the same thing applies. But you'd normally see it, or not normally, but you can usually see it in V5 or 6. So this is a strain pattern associated with the left ventricular hypertrophy, or your LVH. All right? Just using the Sokolov line criteria, adding up your S waves and your R waves in V1 and 6. All right? So let's look at another one. So that's up, down, down. So this is obvious left axis deviation, all right? Not physiologic. This is a pathologic left axis deviation. So here, I'm looking at my R waves, very deep R wave, I'm sorry, S waves in V2. Big R wave in V6. So if I add that up, if I add this S wave up here in V2 or V1, add it to the uh, R wave in V5 or V6, that equals 35 millimeters, that is left ventricular hypertrophy. I also have ST segment depression. All right? That is strain pattern. That is strain pattern on the lateral side of the heart because of the left ventricular hypertrophy. I can also see some ST segment depression in one in ABL. So I have a complete lateral strain, left ventricular hypertrophy. All right? Pretty cool stuff. That's it. That's hypertrophy on an EKG. If you have any questions, don't be afraid to ask. Lake, hope I made you happy, brother. See ya.